So we went through and created our slide deck, and we created this wonderful slide deck of stuff we're going to share with you. And we got to the end, and Josh says to me, uh, do you realize we didn't put the Helm logo anywhere in the slide deck? And so we've got one slide. This is the Helm logo for the project we're going to talk about. Uh, this is our logo. And so, uh, hi, I'm Matt. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the Helm maintainers, and this is Josh. He's the, one of the other Helm maintainers. There's several of us, and we're going to walk you through Helm today. Uh, so I thought it would be great to talk about where Helm came from, to understand why we have it. Yeah. Uh, Helm was the product of a company called Deas, Helm version 1. Uh, Deas had a platform as a service called Workflow. And just with platform as a service, you'd deploy a 12-factor application, uh, and you'd run it somewhere. And they built it so that you could run it on top of Kubernetes. But as with all platform as a service, you don't want to just have a 12-factor app. You need some place to store your stuff. Uh, MySQL, Postgres, something like that. And they needed a way to uh, install that into your Kubernetes cluster as well. And thus, Helm was born. Helm was born that gave you the ability to install that other thing to go along with the PaaS. Now, as you can see, this is uh, an archive site. There's the Internet Archive to show it, because Deus isn't around anymore. Uh, this is one of those things where Helm lived on and became successful, and Deus is sadly not here. Uh, so what is Helm? Helm is a package manager. Make sense? Enough said? Uh, probably not. But Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. And, and as I said this morning, it is kind of like apt or yum or homebrew for Kubernetes. But what is a package manager? I grabbed a couple of definitions here. Uh, one is off of Wikipedia, and the other is off of the Helm website. You can see the Helm one is kind of targeted at how Helm does things. And the Wikipedia one talks a bit about how things happen. It does installing, upgrading, configuring. Um, it's the, the technical bits of what's going on when you use a package manager. And the Wikipedia one is based on apt, which is, was inspiration for Helm. But it doesn't get to the core essence of it, I don't think. And so I came up with what I think is my own definition here. And this is, you know, a package manager takes, um, you've got knowledge. Somebody's got knowledge on an application like Postgres, how it works, what it does, um, how to run it on a system. And they know a system, right? Something like Ubuntu or Debian or Red Hat. And they know how to run it on there, where configuration files go, um, where the binaries need to go, what needs to happen, the startup processes. And they can take all of that knowledge and that business logic and combine it into a package. And then they can deliver that package in a way that somebody who doesn't know any of that, they don't know, you know, they may not know much about Debian or Ubuntu or where to put this stuff. They definitely don't know the business logic about Postgres. And they can install it, and they can run it, and it works. And it's simple. And it's the ability to take that complex business logic, package it up so somebody else doesn't need to. And you can have a few people who have a lot of knowledge, and they can share it so many, many people who don't have that knowledge can go use something. And that's where package managers are really powerful. Uh, so let's take a look at a simple update, an apt update, an apt example, right? You can install Maria this way with apt on Ubuntu. It's simple, right? You do uh, apt update, and that'll update your knowledge about your packages, and then you install it, and it just works. Now, we could go a little bit more complicated. Here's Postgres. Because something like Ubuntu doesn't know about Postgres, you've got to do the first couple of commands here where you add knowledge. You've got to deal with certificates because they have encryption and security. And so you've got to grab that. And then you grab knowledge about the package for Postgres. And then the same thing happens. You do an update to get the latest details after you've added a, a repository. And then you can install it. it. It's pretty simple. And you've got four lines you can paste into a terminal. And it just works. So let's look at what it would look like with Helm. Helm, two simple lines, right? In this case, we're adding a chart repo. It's the Bitnami one in this case. And then you're installing MariaDB from the Bitnami repo. It's simple. Now it's installed into your cluster, and it works. Uh, that's what Helm does. It took something complicated. This would be um, a stateful set. You're probably going to have some secrets. You're going to have other details. And Kubernetes manifests. And it makes it simple to install and just have working. Uh, but before we dig into Helm a little bit, I wanted to ask a question. Is Helm trustworthy, right? You're going to see a lot of things at the conference this week, a lot of new projects and products and things like that. And we're going to definitely walk through Helm here in a minute. But I thought it was a good question to ask, 
is it trustworthy? Is it worth using? And so I wanted to walk through a few things that kind of highlight that. Uh, the first is, as you can see, uh, from the first Helm security report here, uh, they gave us a glowing recommendation. In fact, this was one of uh, a fantastic process to go through, to learn about the security implications, to have them review the code and the process. And it's something we will repeat. Um, but I, I love this line in the middle. Helm can be recommended for public deployment. We never expected such a glowing recommendation from a security auditor. Uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about was Helm's longevity. If you actually look at this, we've got a bunch of events on here, and you can see Helm started all the way back in 2015. And since then, uh, we've had all kinds of events along the way. There was Helm version one, then Helm version two. We've had Helm summits. We've had massive growth. Helm joined the CNCF, uh, other than being a project with Kubernetes. And what this speaks to is longevity. Lots of products and projects in this space come and go. Helm is one of those projects that um, has amazed me with its longevity and how long it's been around for. Uh, and that speaks to hopefully in the future it'll be around. And of course this morning you probably saw we've passed a million downloads per month. And what I find most interesting about this is that it speaks to reproducibility, right? We can re reproducibility eh, uh, get Helm out to places all over the internet uh, to CI systems like Circle CI or to countries all over the world like China and, and uh, wherever. We can deliver Helm to all of these places reproducibly every month. We use semantic versioning and we actually take this really, really seriously because we realize lots of things change and we want something stable that you can count on. And so with Helm, you know, semantic versioning, uh, you have to break APIs. Anytime you break an API, you increment the major. When you add features, you increment the minor. And when you just have bug fixes or, or um, non-feature changes, you can increment the patch. And we take this very, very seriously because we know that if somebody's incrementing the minor and breaking, say, Go APIs, that that can be really frustrating. And we don't want to do that in the experience. And so Helm 3 was just released. And you'll see that our Go APIs aren't going to change until Helm 4. Uh, you'll find that the command lines aren't going to be broken until Helm 4 when maybe we do that. You can trust those things from Helm. And of course, there's Helm 2 support. We know that Helm, you know, it takes the time for people to change. And so what do we do? We have good support windows because we want to support everybody who's using Helm, give them time to make the change, not, you know, with everything else going on, not have people feel rushed or stressed or anything else. Uh, because we're there to support you. And, and here's one of the neat things we do. We've added release candidates. Whenever we have a major or minor version, we do release candidates. So you can take the release for a spin uh, before it comes out and give us feedback. Because we realize that release candidates and giving everybody an opportunity to look at a release before it comes out and just upgrading without thinking, um, some of you may not want to. In fact, we've had more release candidates come out than releases um, since we started doing this. And if you want, we have a power users mailing list where we will email you every time a release candidates come out and we're gonna do this, go through this cycle. So that way you can see and follow along because we wanna notify you. We wanna give our power users, our people who want to engage an opportunity to engage at that point. We also have a lot of maintainers. There's no one company or one person or a few people who control Helm. Uh, and, and if something happens and a company has to back out or some people have to back out, we're here. We're not a, a one-hit wonder, a, a small project like that. We really do have um, lots of people who are engaged and who are there for the long haul. And of course, we sign our releases. If you're into security, and, and we've got several security features in Helm, including things like provenance and signing charts, but we actually sign our, uh, every stable release. So you can validate that it came from one of the Helm maintainers. You can see that it came from us. And so we value these kinds of things that hopefully lead to a stable, long project uh, that'll continue long into the future and that you can trust. And, of course, we don't just deliver for Mac and Linux, which many systems do. We also deliver for Windows because we know Windows is incredibly popular with lots of developers. Some of them don't want to admit it. Um, it may not always be the coolest thing. Sometimes our companies have us doing this, uh, but we do. We have Mac, Linux, and Windows support because we want to support all the developers out there who are engaging with Helm. All right, so I'm going to hand it off to Josh so he can dig into how you use Helm.
Thanks. Um, hi. Very happy to be here. I realize m most people are over here, so I'll talk like this. Um, so I'm going to talk about what, uh, what exactly Helm is, um, how you would use it, uh, and give some detailed examples. Um, so Helm is made up of um, packages that are referred to as charts. So if you hear the word Helm chart, we're really just talking about a package that um, Helm knows about. Um, charts are made up of several well-known file names um, in, a, in a directory tree. Um, and I'm, about, I'm about to go into sort of what each of those look like. Um, so Helm is a command. Um, this is our first instance of an example Helm command on the left, Helm create. Um, Helm is a command that will scaffold out um, an example chart for you. And this is, a, this is what it looks like in a directory tree. Um, some of these files, uh, I'll go through each of them. So this is, this is called chart.yaml. This is where you're putting the metadata about the chart, what is the name of the chart, the version, um, a description for it, um, and other important information that um, lets Helm know what to do with your package. Um, additionally, you can, in this file, specify dependencies. So there might be some other chart that your, um, that your package relies on. Um, so here's an example, uh, MariaDB. So you might have your application that requires that there's a database running. You can actually specify in this file, give me these external dependencies, and it will deploy that as part of your installation. Um, this, this file is called values.yaml. Um, this file basically specifies the default settings for your chart. So um, things like uh, what is the container image that your, that your deployment's going to use, um, what type of service is a cluster IP, a load balancer, et cetera, um, and any other type of um, configurable parameters, um, the default values of which go into this file um, inside your Helm chart. Um, there is a directory in Helm charts called templates. Anything under that directory um, is treated as a YAML uh, template. So what happens is you can see all these curly braces. This is using uh, the templating language within Go, Golang. Um, and then essentially that last file we looked at, it takes those, uh, those configuration settings, applies it against this, and turns it into um, Kubernetes YAML um, that's, that's applied over the API. Um, here's a special file that sits next to the templates called helpers. This is an optional file. Um, if you do the Helm create command, you get uh, an example of this. But this is for sections of YAML that you w may want to repeat all over the place. So you want a specific set of labels on all of your resources um, for that application, for example you can set these, um, these sort of functions in this templates file called helpers TPL, and then you can use this all over in your chart. Um, and then also test. So uh, any, any file that has test in the name is treated, um, is treated as a Helm test file. And there's actually a Helm command where once you've installed the release, you can run Helm test it will look at these files and run some sort of check. For example, is my database up? Um, things like that. Um, and then finally, uh, notes.txt. This is a friendly, um, also templatable um, file. Um, but this will basically, when the end user, when the operator installs your chart, says, um, here's how to use the application. You can put an ASCII turtle if you want. You can do whatever you want. Um, so yeah, so like I was saying, um, the templates are treated as dynamic YAML, uh, YAML templates. Um, and what this does is it prevents that you're duplicating the same code everywhere. So imagine um, if you had 10 microservices and you're running the same, you're writing the same um, deployment.yaml and service.yaml for all these things, you could bake that into a Helm chart and deploy it with a different Docker image and things like that. Um, and values. Values are uh, the configuration for the chart. Um, and basically, you can put them into a file. 
um, values.yaml is the defaults. You can have a custom values file, which we'll talk about in a second, or you can set them one by one. So the combination of templates and values, um, the result of combining these two together will give us hopefully valid um, Kubernetes YAML that is then applied and installed into your cluster. So how do you install one of these packages? Helm has a command, helm install. Um, you either point to a local directory containing these files, or you can use what's called, what's known as a chart repository, um, which is just a cache of these um, packages that have been released um, at a previous date. Um, so once you install it, uh, we, it runs the templating on, that, uh, on those templates, installs it into Kubernetes. Um, so you might want to, for example, do different things, deploy your application a little bit differently in development than you would in production. For example, um, you might want a node port service running locally, but you actually want a load balancer when you're running in AWS or some um, you know, target production environment. And so that's where custom values come in. And what this does is it allows you to provide custom um, custom configurations for, uh, for your chart and provides dynamic results. Um, and there's several ways to do that. You can use the dash F flag. This will, you can put an entire um, YAML file with uh, any number of nested values inside of it. Or if you wanna just set one little parameter, you can use the dash dash set flag. Or you can use any combination of dash F dash set. Um, and the way that it works is it collapses from right to left. So anything on the right is giving you the, la uh, the latest and it kind of um, collapses down. On, and then the final one being the defaults. And those are the values applied against um, your installation. So Helm actually manages the life cycle of your application. It's not just this templating engine, but it actually um, gives, you, gives you tools to manage the installation and the removal and um, to query the status. So for example, we have a, a Helm status command. You run that against something you've just installed. Um, and Helm will return to you whether it's healthy, what revision it's on, when it was installed, and we'll give you the notes back as well. Um, Helm list. Uh, so um, one of the nice things about Helm in comparison to just running kubectl or just running um, another tool that just installs the YAML, Helm actually stores something in the cluster um, that, ma that manages the revision of that, um, of that release. So we have a record of everything that's been installed with Helm, what's the revision of that, what chart it came from, and so on. If you wanna upgrade, if you wanna change something about your release, um, this doesn't require a whole new installation. You can actually run the Helm upgrade command. Um, the Helm upgrade command, you point to, um, you may have updated your chart so you can see my app directory. You may have updated a, a file in there um, or you're upgrading to a new chart version or in most cases you're updating the configuration. So let's say you have an installation of my microservice and you've released a new Docker tag or container image tag, I should say, and you've bumped that version, you can apply it against the existing release. Um, and Helm will make sure that the, that the deployment or whatever the resource was that was referencing that value is refreshed and your pods are cycled um, and things like that. So let's say you do do an upgrade and something goes terribly wrong. Um, there is a rollback command. So since Helm manages every single revision of every single release, um, if you have done an upgrade and now you're on revision two, you can say Helm rollback my release one to the first revision and we'll take back, it will take care of getting you to that state, um, that working state of revision number one. Uh, and then finally, um, if you want to completely uninstall your application from Helm, there's a, there's a command for that as well. And that's Helm delete. And this will, anything that was installed that was under that templates directory that's been installed into Kubernetes, Helm will make sure that it's removed. So this is, um, this is one of the things that uh, is really powerful about Helm is that you've installed a bunch of YAML into your cluster um, that's part of a specific application. Um, if you're just doing a massive kubectl apply and there's all these things running and you want to get rid of them, it's very hard to keep track of um, 
what you're trying to remove. And so Helm is a very good way to put this thing into a box, put it in, upgrade it, and then take it out of the cluster. Um, so that's the details about Helm. I'll move back to Matt for a little bit more info on Helm. All right, so one thing, uh, I noticed people taking photos of the slides up here as you went along, and, and that's great, but I also wanted to let you know that if you go to the schedule and you pull up this session, you can download a PDF of all of these slides as well, so if you wanna get them after the fact, you can always come back and get them. So let's talk about Helm, and th there's actually more to Helm than the Helm client. Uh, Helm, just like Kubernetes and some of these other things, has multiple projects because we really want to make people successful using the client, using packages, moving things around, and it turns out there's more we can do to it than just have a client. And the first thing we have is we have the Helm Hub. The Helm Hub is a place you can go, hub.helm.sh, that will help you find charts to install. Uh, it's a place where you can search, you can view, you can read up on many charts from many people. They're distributed all over the place. They're not just hosted by the Helm project. They're hosted by companies who are, are actually building the projects and products that you want to use. And they're hosting these. And while they're distributed, the Helm Hub is a central search location where you can discover those. And not only can you discover them, but like in this example, you can read about them. So here we've got the description that's in the readme of the package. And on the right, if you look, you'll actually see there's commands on how you can add the chart repository that it is, and you can go ahead and install it. And if you see on the right, there's even things about different versions. So if you want to read some of the, the details of the different versions, you can click those links on the right there to the versions and read more about past versions. And you can see what's going on here. But the Helm Hub isn't just for some targeted set of companies. It's actually for anybody who wants to go ahead and make charts and share them with others. We want to make this easy, easy to discover and easy to share. So if you head over to GitHub, you can see here's all of the charts and here's all the companies and people and their repositories. And you can add your own and it's as simple as a pull request. You can also learn about hosting your own chart repository there and how you could do that before, you know, th that step you need to get started before you share. Uh, and Helm, the Helm Hub, is actually running something called Monocular. Monocular is another project hosted by Helm, and this project is used to power that, but it doesn't have to do that. Say you've got a company or an organization and you've got your own internal charts and you want to make them searchable, discoverable, put a nice UI on it, you can run this yourself right in your own Kubernetes cluster and point it at your chart repositories. And so this is one of the other things we have. That stuff that powers the Helm Hub is available to you. And if you want to run a chart repository, we have another project called Chart Museum. Helm itself, the Helm client, can do a static chart repository. You can use commands that'll generate the parts you need, the index.yaml that transfers information. You can read more about this at the Helm website, stuff like that. Uh, but if you want something that's more dynamic, something that you might put in front of object storage where you can push and pull charts from the way you would images, uh, Chart Museum will let you do that and it'll generate the index.yaml. It sits in front of it. Uh, that's one of the other projects that we have because we want to make it easy to have chart repositories, whether they're static or dynamic with a server in front. Uh, we've got tools for that. And of course, if you've got charts, you probably want to test them, right? You're going to hear a lot of talk here about CI, CD, um, about testing. And we firmly believe in that. We, we do constant testing with everything that we have in Helm. And we provide a tool. We have our own chart repository uh, with Stable and Incubator. And this is the tool that we use. And we developed it in the way that Helm um, needs it to test our own charts. It'll test YAML. It has the ability to install charts and actually test that they're functioning using tests that can be packaged in charts. It will do linting on charts to make sure that your indentations are consistent. It has all kinds of tools, and we've made this available so lots of people can use it. It's just one of the other projects we have, and companies are using this today on their chart repositories. And of course, uh, we talk a little bit, today you learned about Helm 3, but if you are using Helm 2, uh, and you want to make that jump from Helm 2 to Helm 3, we've got another project, and that project will help you do that migration. Um, in Helm 2, you would have heard a little bit about Tiller, that thing that I said this morning uh, is gone, and there's certain ways that data is stored, and we want to make it easy to make that transition, 
and we have Helm 2 to 3 plugin that will do that for you. It helps you along the way. It has features like dry run. It'll help you run two systems side by side if you want, test things out. It does a lot of those things. Uh, and then we've got stuff like Chart Releaser. Now, Chart Releaser here is a project that you can use uh, that will help you release your charts when you want it. You can tie it to CI, uh, and it's one of the other projects we have to help you run your own chart repositories. All right, but we go beyond Helm. Um, beyond just the Helm project, right? We as a project have it, but there's a whole ecosystem around Helm of stuff that you can use. And here I've got a few things. There's Flux, which is a, that, that symbol in the top left is Flux. It's another CNCF project. It's one of the new sandbox ones. Uh, it works with Helm. Next to it, there's Drone. Drone is a CI system that works with Helm. Airship is something from the OpenStack project. It works with Helm. Was my uh, and Helm file on the right there. Helm file is a configuration management system that can sit on top of Helm and help you deploy and manage your configuration. There's a whole ecosystem of tools out there built around Helm that will help you with packages, managing it, and running that installation, especially as you want to get more complicated with what you do. Now, Helm did something neat in Helm 3. We have an experiment. In fact, we added a new system to Helm 3 to let us do experiments where the API isn't stable yet, but some of this is because we can't. And the experiment we have going right now is the ability to use OCI repositories, that's where you push and pull your images from, to store Helm charts. Uh, this is a new thing coming. The reason it is an experiment is we're still working with uh, the Open Container Initiative, the OCI, to to work out the spec, to work out the bumps, because storing artifacts other than container images is new for them. And we wanted to release Helm 3, so it's an experiment, and so things may change there, and lots of places don't support it yet, but we're working with the OCI so that hopefully in the future it's a stable feature that you can push and pull your, your charts from OCI containers. You can have them right next to your images. And there are places that support this today that you can use it with. Now, I do want to give you a notice here. If you go out searching the web for Helm, uh, you're going to find a lot about Helm 2. Helm 3 was just released last week. So make sure that you check that it's for the right release of Helm as you're browsing, reading articles, you're on Stack Overflow, you're in places like that. Um, because you'll find that there are changes and differences um, just between versions. So be careful when you're out there looking that it's for the right version of Helm. Um, so here's how you can get engaged. We, we love engagement with Helm. We love issues, feedback, showing up at meetings. You can see we have Slack rooms, we've got a mailing list, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, you can follow us on social media. You can engage with the project. Uh, we welcome that. The image up there is of our um, meetings because all of our meetings are recorded and they're put up on YouTube. And you'll actually see this was done on Halloween. And so you can see Josh in a costume up there. Yep. It's a hot dog. It's a hot dog. All right, the next thing is we have a booth. So tonight when you're doing the crawl or when you're here, um, many of the CNCF projects have a booth. So if you've got questions, and I expect you do, please feel free to come by our booth and ask. There's gonna be somebody there most of the time. Uh, please come by, ask questions, engage with us. We wanna help you be successful. And if you go there, you'll get an opportunity to meet the maintainers. And we're happy to hear your feedback and, and try to help you. Um, tomorrow, we have the Helm 3 deep dive. And so if you want to dig deep on Helm 3, maybe you came here and you're like, this session isn't for me, I'm looking for more, this is probably the session for you. A couple of the Helm maintainers are going to go deep on Helm 3 to explain what's changed and what it means to you. And if you're new and you want to learn, go ahead and check it out. Uh, so with that, does anybody have any questions? I see we've got a microphone here. Uh, can you walk to the microphone? This is recorded, I believe, and so they'll want to have it on the recording. Yeah, forgive me, I didn't look at the release three um, notes, but as far as release two, I sort of had to externalize my at rest encryption using, you know, like Gitcrypt or Ansible Vault. I looked at the Dare project as far as baked in encryption for Helm, but I just was wondering, is that on the roadmap or a current feature as far as at rest encryption for some of the secrets that are custom made and not dynamically generated in the Helm charts? At-risk encryption for secrets? Yes. Uh, that's probably not for Helm. Uh, secrets in Kubernetes, you can now have pluggable backends, 
And so you can plug in the, the storage mechanism of your choice to deal with the encryption. That's probably the more appropriate way because it's something you should have Kubernetes-wise, and it's a, a choice for you whether you're in a public cloud and they use something like a key vault, or if you're on-premise and you fit your own system in there. Yeah. Um, so um, what I was wondering is uh, what, what's the, is there like a, for the stable charts or the charts that are out there now, like how do we tell which ones are Helm 3 or is there a separate repo for the uh, GitHub or something for the Helm 3 charts or is there something we need to do to convert them or? Most Helm 2 charts should work. There's a couple of edge cases where they don't, some things around CRDs, um, but most of them should work with Helm 3 if they work with Helm 2 and you can discover those on hub.helm.sh. And then I was also wondering about the um, Helm provider for Terraform. Does that work with Helm 3? I don't know the answer to that yet. It may not because it's so newly released. I, I haven't actually looked. I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Okay. There, are some, there are some tools that do support Helm 3 already. Um, Helm File is one of them. I think Weave as well, Weave Flux. Are there any other questions? Oh, I see one coming. Are there any recommended ways of storing encrypted secrets in a Helm chart or any tools? To manage secrets with Helm? Is that your question? Yeah, like. Um, yeah, I, so I uh, hear this question a lot. Um, the recommendation I usually have is to use a tool called um, Mozilla SOPS, S-O-P-S. Um, and you can store secrets encrypted at rest in your repository, and your installation process then becomes kubectl, like, or decrypt the, the SOPS encrypted files, apply them as raw Kubernetes YAML, and then in your Helm chart, just use a secret ref, so you're not like baking secrets into your, um, into your Helm values, like the actual key values for the secrets. What is that called again, Mozilla? Mo so Mozilla, um, they have an open source project called SOPS. And SOPS. It allows you, SOPS, and it allows you to maintain the structure of YAML, um, but the values, like the keys are visible, but the values are completely encrypted using some sort of KMS key that you would then only use during your CI process. So does, this, does it go into the source control or is it only during the deployment? Uh, I'm, say, I'm sorry? Does the secret go into the deployment or in the source control? Like, uh, uh, it, it, so I think some of this is going to depend on your, I don't know if you've had any policies or processes. It, some people want to store their secrets out of band from their applications. Um, others might use a tool like SOPS where you're going to, um, when you have the chart at rest, maybe you're storing it in Git or something like that, it will encrypt all of the metadata on it. Uh, so you can't actually read the values of the secrets. Uh, there are a number of strategies and plugins on how you can do this, and a lot of it depends on the kind of process you or your organization wants, because there's a few different ways to do it. If you want to chat afterwards, we can probably talk about it, or this is something you can do in a search engine. Thank you. Yeah. I was just going to add to, as an answer to his question, one of the things we're looking at is external secrets by GoDaddy. It introduces a new Kubernetes object. And so in that, you could use a config map to infer your secrets and use a different system to fetch those secrets. So you're not putting anything in the Helm chart that's going to reveal your secrets. Sure. And so we use AWS, for example. So you could use AWS Secrets Manager, and then the app will just pull those things out from the config map and the external secrets. What was, well. it, what was the name of the project? It's called External Secrets. So external think it's secrets. like external DNS, but for secrets, so it's external help. secrets. And they have a plug-in interface, so you could plug any secret system, Vault, or AWS Secrets Manager into it and just use that ex external system. And external secrets is one of those things you can find in the Helm Hub to install using Helm. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, another question? Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, Helm seems really useful for installing other people's applications, but what about your own? Uh, do you have any, anything to share about when you would want to use Helm for your own applications that you're building and uh, what are some of the best practices around that? Uh, that's a wonderful question. Um, people can be divided on this. Um, I, I think it's going to depend on your style and how you want to do things in your internal processes. 
Uh, if you have things like you're gonna pass it around where lots of people aren't gonna know but they need to install it easily, Helm is great for that. If everybody's gonna know all of the intricate YAML and it's pretty much gonna be the same, it may not be such a thing, right? And granted, you're gonna have a lot of intricate YAML. I mean, I, I generated the YAML for deploying WordPress with a database at one point. Just the simple one, but production ready. It was like 13 manifests. Now, if I knew those manifests and I could go hack on them and I was always gonna deploy the same things, yeah, if I was gonna have differences in different environments, if other people were gonna go install those and I didn't want them to have to deal with the complexities of installing them and modifying them, then I find it to be really useful to package it up as a Helm chart because that makes it easy to install. Um, but I think some of this is gonna depend on your taste and your workflow and what you're trying to accomplish and who the people are involved in this who've gotta deal with it. And, and in, in my case, I like simplicity. I wanna simplify their lives and what's the best way to do that and that depends. I don't know, Josh, do you have an Yeah, I mean, I, um, one thing I like to point out a lot is that there's not really any one way to use Helm. It just depends on your, uh, your workflow and your use case. Like I was uh, recently working on a project and there was nine microservices as part of this big deployment. And so I started out, I was building a Helm chart for each of these services. At about number two or three, I realized like they were all pretty much the same HTTP listening service. So instead talked with the team and decided, let's build a single Helm chart that works exactly the same for every service. And so we use a single Helm chart to deploy nine different services, doing a different configuration for each, just setting a new Docker tag for that specific, um, for that specific service. But that's, that's usually not the way you see Helm charts, but um, just trying to get at that there's several different ways. And that's an example for using a library chart, which is new to Helm. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we are out of time. Thank you everyone for coming uh, and have a wonderful KubeCon and CloudNativeCon.